Welcome to Connor's Corner. Right now, we're very pleased to have former White House Chief of Staff, former Governor of the State of New Hampshire, John Sununu. And he's come out with a book called The Quiet Man. How are you doing today, Governor? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on. A lot of people in the audience probably know what the book's about, but who is The Quiet Man? Well, the book is about um, the president I served as Chief of Staff for, President George Herbert Walker Bush, the 41st President of the United States. Uh, Most people refer to him as old President Bush in contrast with young President Bush. But uh, I call him the quiet man because, frankly, uh, he he was an individual, a president that believed uh, in having his performance speak for itself and really hated to talk about what he accomplished, hated to brag. And uh, I felt uh, now that history was getting a better perspective on him, that it would be good for me to put between uh, two covers of a book uh, in one place where people could find it all together, all all of his great accomplishments, including not just his foreign policy accomplishments, but his great domestic policy achievements. All right. Now, probably no man ever came to the presidency better prepared for the job than George Herbert Walker Bush. I, I don't think anybody can disagree with that. No, his background was really quite exceptional. He was the youngest Navy flyer uh, during World War II. He he actually uh, enlisted in the Navy, signed up uh, right after he graduated from high school. He flew 58 combat missions, got shot down, and amazingly was rescued by a sub with a camera on it. And so there's a a fantastic clip of, of him being rescued in the Pacific. Uh, he was our envoy to China. He was chairman of the Republican National Committee. He was uh, the head of the CIA. He served two terms as a vice president. Uh, he had been elected to Congress. So this was a man that, that uh, had a tremendous record of public service even before he became president. All right. Now, I, I know the, the basis of the book in history, or at least in the modern media, George... Your George Bush is maybe not as highly rated as some other people, and I think your book is going to try to correct the record. I think so. I think it clearly uh, the cases can be quite easily made that of all the one-term presidents, he was by far the most outstanding. And I would suggest that even though he only served one term, his total performance really ranks amongst the greatest. Um, everyone knows of his tremendous success in foreign policy and in nurturing the collapse of the Soviet Union um, at a time when when it was uh, 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 the process was not as simple as people ex- uh, 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 looking back as some people think it was, and and I try to explain the complicated aspects of it. Uh, he also made sure that the aggression of Saddam Hussein into Kuwait, trying to take over what would have been 25 or 30 percent of the total oil supply of the world, uh, Kuwait, plus what what he had in Iraq. But George Bush also passed uh, more domestic legislation more sig- and more significant domestic legislation than any president except Lyndon Johnson and uh, Franklin Roosevelt. So, so his achievements on the domestic side were somewhat overshadowed by what he did in foreign policy, and I thought it would be best to kind of package them as as one uh, clear collection of the facts of history so people could see it all together. Now, I know a lot of people have short memories, and in fact, people didn't seem to remember it a couple of years later, but the success of the Gulf War was astonishing at the time. It, it came about because George Bush knew that that uh, the world had begun to think begun to think that the United States was not living up to its responsibilities as a superpower, that after Vietnam we were completely unwilling to project power. Uh, But he also saw the specific crisis in hand, uh, that you couldn't let someone like Saddam Hussein uh, control the world's economy by controlling so much oil. And frankly, just the fundamental fact that you could not let aggression like that stand, and, and his famous line, this aggression will not stand, he drew the line in the sand, and then he made sure uh, that he fulfilled his commitment, and, and he slowly built up our troops in the Middle East, and then um, in in what was effectively a four- or five-day battle, uh, kicked Saddam Hussein out of there, 
And then, I think, uh, to his great credit, even though he got criticized at the time for it, he was smart enough not to chase Saddam into Baghdad and get caught in the quicksand of an occupation at that time. And yet, at the same time, I remember he was criticized very heavily for that. Well, he was, and now uh, even his critics that look back recognize that uh, that was really a wise move. So uh, history has a way of sometimes... Um, uh, correcting, if you will, the excesses of the emotional press of the day. Now, some people would say, you know, well, the collapse of the Soviet Union was inevitable and it was going to happen. So what really did George Bush have to do with it? Well, it really wasn't inevitable. And if you read even Gorbachev's memoirs, he talks about uh, the concerns he had with the hardliners who were not really excited with uh, Gorbachev's inclination to try and open up the Soviet's economy to the West and become a sharing partner in economic prosperity. Uh, Gorbachev thought that the economic line uh, route would be a better route for Russia than the route of constant confrontation. But the hardliners uh, were not happy with it. Bush's art form, if you will, was bringing together the NATO allies, uh, Mrs. Thatcher, Francois Mitterrand in France, uh, Helmut Kohl in Germany, uh, to uh, come together on a strategy to encourage Gorbachev to go quickly with some of the changes that he might be inclined to do, and then to do it in such a way that it did not create um, a, an excuse, if you will, for the hardliners to prevent Gorbachev from going further. And the way he managed that is really uh, a classic example of smart diplomacy by a smart American president. Again, you were talking about his record with Congress, and he was able to compromise with Congress, which maybe led to his defeat in the next election. Well, Congress at the time was completely controlled by the Democrats. Uh, Tom Foley, the Speaker of the House, the Democratic Speaker of the House, uh, had a majority of 260 to 175 in the House, and George Mitchell, the Democratic leader in the Senate, had 55-45. And, uh, and they were, you know, in, in the nicest sense of the word, the best sense of the word, real professional politicians, but they were also um, uh, tough, tough partisan politicians. And so it was not an easy thing to do. But Bush was able to uh, get, first of all, uh, his much criticized at the time five-year budget agreement in which he, uh, the Foley and Mitchell made him eat his words, so to speak, of read my lips, no new taxes. But he got a package that, that had three and a half times the spending cuts as the taxes he accepted, and the tax he accepted was a gasoline tax that had not been adjusted for inflation in nearly a decade. And and even though um, after the revolt, of, of, if you want to call it that, of the, some of the Republicans where he lost some of the support that they had assured him he had, uh, the Democrats changed it to uh, some of the gas tax to an increase in the highest end personal income tax rate from 28 to 31. Even though all that came together, what he did is, uh, is achieved a package of spending cuts and new budgeting rules that put a cap on growth and spending and new rules that required new programs to be paid for so that that uh, budget agreement produced all the surpluses of the 90s that everybody else likes to brag about uh, and produced the growth period, which is one of the most uh, dynamic growth periods the country ever had. Now, you were there. How do you explain his defeat in the election of uh, 1992? Well, I refer to it as a combination of things that I put under, uh, also under the umbrella of the Churchill effect. And I remind people that in World War II, Winston Churchill led England uh, against the Nazis and, and the coalition of allies against the Nazis, and, and really was the heart and soul of keeping it all together and inspiring England to put up its great resistance, and was the hero, if you will, of World War II for the British. And yet, even uh, just before the war ended, uh, when Britain had a new election, they voted Churchill out because they wanted now to start looking inward and, and looking towards another political party, perhaps, to lead the domestic changes now that the foreign policy pressures of war had been relieved. Well, I think the same thing happened to George Bush after the Soviet Union collapsed and he kicked Saddam out of Kuwait the world exhaled a bit uh, politically, and not only did Bush lose, 
but Mrs. Thatcher had been kicked out of uh, her control of her party by her own party. Mitterrand lost his election. Cole eventually lost his election. Gorbachev himself lost, uh, uh, and uh, other leaders like Mulroney and the Japanese prime minister all lost. As the world kind of looked and, and re- felt this relief from the confrontation of two superpowers, and, and everybody decided to look at different political parties to do different things within their own countries. In addition to that, of course, there was Ross Perot, and Perot comes in as a third-party candidate and takes 19% of the vote, two-thirds of which uh, should have been Bush's. That alone was was uh, enough to cause the defeat. And the third reason is another... Uh, there's another interesting reason which has some applicability as we look at politics today, and that is uh, since... Eisenhower, no party has, uh, in the United States since 1952, no party has controlled the White House for more than eight years except once, and that, of course, is the four years of George Herbert Walker Bush succeeding Ronald Reagan. But there seems to be a tendency in this country that every eight years or less, we, we tend to clean out the White House of one party and put a new party in. And, of course, uh, the election in 2016 will be the eight years of Obama will be up. And uh, and uh, we'll see whether this, this trend, of this pattern of history to make party changes in the White House will continue. But I think in combination, those three effects combined together uh, made it an awfully tough election for George Bush to win. Now, one of the things we haven't talked about, the character and the personality of George Bush. What can you add to that? You know, well, let's go back to the title of the of the of the book, The Quiet Man. Um, George Bush's mother admonished him once uh, by saying, "George, uh, don't brag and bend your knees when you volley." Uh, a reference to tennis, and and really, there's two messages in that 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 Bush took to heart. The first about not bragging. He really hated to talk about himself and. And I actually took the title from a line that he used himself in the 1988 acceptance speech at the Republican convention when he got the, confirmed as the candidate for the Republican Party for president. His line was, uh, I'm a quiet man, but I hear the quiet people that others don't. And, and that was really a definition of his style. But the second message um, that his mother gave him, bend your knees when you volley, really carried with it much more than than, uh, you might gather from it at first. What she was saying when she said that is, look, whatever you do, volley or or in, in tennis or anything else, there's a right way to do it. And so when you do anything, do it the right way. And and George Bush, those two suggestions, uh, admonitions from his mother really influenced much of what he did. He was always willing to share the limelight uh, with others like Mrs. Thatcher and Mitterrand and Cole in terms of the unification of Europe. Uh, He did the same thing domestically when he uh, pushed hard for certain pieces of legislation and got, got results like the Clean Air Bill and the Civil Rights Bill and the Americans with Disabilities Act and the crime bill and, and restructuring agriculture and so on. He shared, the, he was very willing to share the credit with others. And, and most of all, when he did things, um, such as trying to get Saddam out of Kuwait, he made sure that, that we did it the right way. Not just do it, but do it right. Finally, what is your opinion of, of George Herbert Walker Bush? Where does he stand as far as the, the presidents of the 20th century? Well, you know, if you t- the polls just came out, a poll just came out a few months ago asking people which of the, the living presidents uh, they thought was the best, and, and George Bush and, and Clinton had a tie, although the tiebreaker, in my opinion, is, is those that, uh, when you look at the negative side of it, Bush came out much better than Clinton on the negative side. So uh, he is certainly being appreciated a little bit more by short-term history here. And I think uh, as people look back more and more, history is going to continue to treat them better and better. And I just hope that what I've put together between the two covers of this book will help people understand the breadth of his success and really the the significance of his success in both domestic and foreign policy. I think he's going to 
uh, continue to move up the ranks as, as history takes a better and deeper look of what he accomplished. Governor Sununu, thank you for your contribution to history. The name of the book is The Quiet Man. I look forward to reading it soon, and I hope our listeners look to it again. The name of the book is Quiet Man by Governor John Sununo. Thank you for being on Connor's Corner. Michael, thank you. I've tried to make it an easy read and a good read for political junkies, so I hope folks enjoy it. Thanks for the chance to be on. Thank you.